My guests in the first part of our program today were reversing the order. Normally, we start with health and nutrition, and then environmental issues, and then important social issues, and a guest. We're reversing, and our guest is at the top of the program because Professor Guy McPherson's in studio. You can see them here and by going to Progressive Radio Network Facebook. And I want to thank the tens of thousands of people who have watched this program now that we're video streaming. And when I go on the road, I'm even setting up a portable studio. So when I'm out filming our new documentary on the environment and on poverty, I'm doing two simultaneously because sometimes they they come together. For example, when I'm filming in two weeks from now, we go out on the 15th uh, or 16th, we're taking a whole caravan of RVs, and I have two camera crews, and uh, we're getting drone cameras and licenses so that we can go over uh, polluting factories that otherwise would be protected. We couldn't be able to film them, and now we can. And the pig farms in North Carolina that are polluting the water, and we can. And going down to follow the the actual route of pollution going from industrial mono farming, single crop like corn or soy, genetically engineered, unfortunately, and how the runoff goes into the Mississippi or Missouri rivers and ultimately goes into the Gulf of Mexico, creating one of the largest dead zones, meaning there's so much algae and so little oxygen that fish can't survive. Now, those are growing. There's over 500 dead zones. And, uh, and these dead zones are getting larger, which means that nothing can live. So we're filming all that because now I can go 25,000 feet up and film a lot of of this that I otherwise couldn't. So we're going to show you the truth. But more importantly, we're going to show you what can be done where possible to mitigate a difference. So today our program is starting with our guest, Guy McPherson, on the environment. Uh, Then while I do the second part of the program, he's going to be in getting set up to film in our studios here in New York City. And he is one of about 70 people we're filming. Just so you understand, how can you put the most comprehensive film ever, ever done? Because we have all the others, and there's some outrageously good films. Ones I highly recommended, like On Ice and, and The Twelfth Hour. But they're bits and pieces. And our mistake is thinking that somehow in an hour and a half feature film, we can capture the magnitude of this problem. We can't. Hence, this one's going to have a... a what would amount to a a teaser of an hour and a half that will be shared worldwide when it's done in about seven months. But then there'll be almost 40 separate films because I'm not cutting anyone short who has something to say that's relevant to the survival of the planet and the human and animal species. And then we're going to health and nutrition later and some very interesting um, uh, commentaries. That said, let me welcome to our studio Guy McPherson. Nice to have you with us, Guy. Thank you, Gary. It's a pleasure to be back. And for people who are not familiar with you, Guy is a professor, was for a long time, and out in Arizona at the University in Environmental Sciences. And you have published in your career on these issues. Um, you, you're an author. Uh, but most importantly, Guy, you're a lightning rod. <laughs> and as we were sharing some insights before we went on the air live here, what it means now when the world is finally catching up to you and when you were so far ahead in being accurate, let's say 10 years ago, six years ago, and prescient two years ago, you scared a lot of people, including scientists. In fact, you were only one of three that I knew of that came forward and just told the truth. But thousands knew the truth. These are not stupid people. These are very aware people, very intelligent. Absolutely. And they hid the truth for whatever their individual reasons, and I'm not ascribing motive. I don't know. So now the world has finally been forced to say, what's going on? So please take us on a a road trip of where we are now, through the tipping points, and most people have never heard of a tipping point, don't know what it is, so please explain the tipping point. And you don't have to go through all of them, but at least the most important ones that are most likely to tip or already have tip and cannot be reversed. And what is the outcome? What is going to happen? For example, 
before we came on, Val, um, who for nearly 30 years has been uh, working on these documentaries, and it's her outstanding talent that gives them that polish and the B-roll. She was showing me footage in California where all these multi-million dollar homes are right at the cliff because all the ground in front of them has fallen away. And there's no way to move these homes. And this all happened in a relatively short period of time, like the last three to four years. So we're not looking at one or two homes. We're looking at thousands that are going to fall into the ocean and not a word about this. So please take us through the problems, the likely outcome, and the, wherever possible, a, and I realize it's a, a guesstimate, the timetable. The form is yours. Yeah, thank you, Gary. We're in the midst of abrupt, irreversible climate change, and very few climate scientists are willing to admit to either abrupt or irreversible. But it's the nature of the beast at this point. There's something that has been called the McPherson paradox. I didn't call it that. Somebody else on Facebook called it that several months ago, and it seems to have caught on. The McPherson paradox indicates that Civilization is a heat engine, so that's that's the first part of the paradox. Civilization is a heat engine. This is based primarily upon the work of Tim Garrett at the University of Utah, atmospheric scientist and professor of atmospheric science, who points out that using the laws of thermodynamics, civilization is a heat engine. This set of living arrangements is a heat engine. Regardless of how it's powered, whether we use solar panels or wind turbines, or fossil fuels, which is the preferred choice, obviously. Civilization itself is a heat engine. That's the first part of the paradox. The second part of the paradox is that turning the heat engine of civilization off warms the planet even faster. And that's because of a process called global dimming, which was only described in the refereed journal literature in December of 2011 by James Hansen and colleagues with a paper indicating that if we cease industrial activity, which is the heat engine, then within about six weeks, because the sulfates fall out of the sky and stop serving as an umbrella, the planet heats up 1.2 plus or minus 2 degrees Celsius. Subsequent work by Levy and colleagues in 2013 indicates that as little as a 35% reduction in industrial activity Think about that for a minute. As little as 35% reduction in industrial activity. Basically, that's the economy of China or maybe the European Union, a little bit more than the European Union or a little bit more than the United States. As little as a 35% reduction in industrial activity increases global average temperature up to one degree Celsius. That's enormous in as little as six weeks. A paper by James Hansen and colleagues, 2017, titled Young People's Burden, the Requirement for Negative CO2 Emissions, indicates that we are at at the highest global average temperature experienced by humans, experienced by homo sapiens, in our 300,000-year history. That suggests to me that uh, that's an indication to me of why we are losing habitat for humans all over the planet. The Middle East and Northern Africa, people are fleeing because they're unable to grow food where they have grown food literally for generations. Intrusion of brackish water in various places in Florida, Miami most notably. Washing away of entire villages in Alaska. As you indicated, homes falling off the cliff as the fires are burning in California. Entire island states in the South Pacific where sea level rise is causing loss of habitat. Marsh, Marshall Islands is right. an example. Yeah. And, and it seems like everywhere I look now, the world is either on fire or it's underwater. There's nothing in between. It's biblical in its proportions. And there, as you indicated, there's very little talk talk about it from the corporate media. There's very little indication that anything is possibly going wrong. We're at the upper limit, global average temperature, at which humans have appeared on this planet. And there's no indication that the precautionary principle should ever come into play here. There's just this mentality of must go faster. It's insane. How how long 
have we been committed to this temperature or the even higher temperature that we will experience in the near future? I d I'm not sure about that. 20 years, 40 years, 100 years? I, I know that you and I were born into it, and essentially everybody on the planet was born into this set of living arrangements without a choice. We didn't get to vote on to whom we were born and where, with what kind of cultural conditions. And so we just showed up at a certain time in history, at a certain place in history, and immediately began doing what was expected of us, what everybody else was doing. And I suspect that's why we're here in this, in the midst of abrupt irreversible climate change, because there was so little thought given by so many people, essentially all people, who just jumped on the treadmill that everybody else was on and adhered to the expectations of others as their way of living. Well, we can certainly understand that so many people want a better quality of life. And with more people and more countries having deprived of quality of life in China, India, Brazil, and other countries, now that they are the fastest growing, uh, let's say, industrialist countries in the world, dwarfing the United States at this point, like China, its gross domestic product this year is now at $13 trillion. Just a few years ago, it was $3 trillion. So they're the second largest economy in the world. Within another three to four years, they're going to be number one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And their idea is, uh, is to keep building more. I mean, and that's contributing to pollution and global warming. Let's look at it from a little different perspective. Let's take people through the biggest likely uh, game changers that they will face in the immediate future, mm -hmm. I mean, within the next, let's look at the next five years mm -hmm. as a reasonable timeline to start seeing some of the consequences of being negligent and living with hubris and indifference. I think the most important factor looming, and, and it could occur as early as September of this year, and I know that that starts tomorrow, it I suspect it will occur no later than October of next year, and that's a an abrupt collapse of the set of living arrangements that we affectionately refer to as civilization. You look at the financial markets, they're a complete mess. This set of living arrangements, like all civilizations, depends upon the ability to grow, store, and distribute grains at scale. We're seeing the grain crop in Europe go up in dust and in flames. We are on the verge of an ice-free Arctic Ocean, as projected by a paper in the Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences in 2012. The president of Finland correctly pointed out more than a year ago in a press conference with Donald Trump, ironically enough, that if we lose the ice in the Arctic Ocean, we lose habitat for humans almost immediately, all, for all of planet Earth. And so we have, pardon the term, the overused cliche, we have a perfect storm of an ice-free Arctic, a civilization that teeters on the brink, the very rapid warming due to the absence of global dimming when the set of living arrangements is reduced or goes away. We have the heat engine of civilization. We have the methane bomb that is poised to go off from the East Siberian Arctic Shelf the largest continental shelf in the world, where Natalia Shikova and her research team have been studying for more than a decade and referred to a 50 gigaton burst of methane as being highly likely at any time 10 years ago. I'm stunned it hasn't gone off yet, given the... Explain to the person who may not understand what methane is, uh, where this is at in the shallow water there. Uh, it's not just in the ocean, but it's also the methane being released from the tundra both in the Russian steppes and in Siberia, and the entire shoreline, that's one of the longest shorelines in the world, and how soil has been frozen solid for thousands of years is now thawing, and that's releasing these methane bubbles. Right, right. <coughs> methane hydrates or clathrates are mm, ice-bound molecules of methane. Methane is CH4. We know it as the primary component of natural gas. And it's more than 100 times more powerful a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is, molecule for molecule. So a little bit of methane really goes a long way towards heating the planet. 
initially locally and regionally and globally because of the atmospheric mixing of methane and other atmospheric components. Uh, Natalia Shikova and her research team have conducted many expeditions on and beneath the ice in, at, at the East Siberian Arctic Shelf. And their latest paper, at least the latest one I've seen, came out in the summer of 2017 and confirmed the likelihood of a large release of methane from the relatively shallow seafloor of the Arctic Ocean because that water is warming up. And now we found out within the last week that the Arctic ice is warming from below. So it's not just the sun striking the ice and melting it. It's warming from below. The Washington Post ran a piece, must be about a month ago now, indicating that the Atlantic Ocean and the Arctic Ocean are so intermixed that they have become one and the same, at least where they meet. So the the biology, the ecosystems within the Arctic are severely disturbed, dis disrupted, and it, that is having consequences that are already global and that will certainly continue. How long will we have habitat for humans throughout the globe, in any place around the globe? I suspect it won't be long before we lose habitat for our species. We are at the upper end right now, according to the paper by Hansen and colleagues, Young People's Burden, in 2017, we're at the upper limit that humans have, uh, have appeared on this planet in terms of global average temperature. And yet we keep warming the planet. There's, there's no indication we have any interest in slowing down. There's no interest that reducing industrial activity would help. In fact, that would cause the acceleration of global average temperature. So we're in this damned if you do, damned if you don't situation where we can maintain the heat engine known as civilization, and that will continue to heat the planet, or we can turn it off and that will heat the planet even faster. Let's, and that methane burp that you're referring to, that 50 megaton, gigaton. 50 gigaton burst, gigaton and, burst. and there are billions of tons of, methane hydrate in the Arctic Ocean. So once this cycle starts, where no one will see it, no one will hear it, but the atmosphere temperature will start to rise. It'll be like that movie, The Day After Tomorrow, where the Scottish scientists started seeing these anomalies of uh, phenomenal uh, weather changes and couldn't explain it. That's what we'll start to see. That's and right. Uh, interesting you bring that up, that paper the, that movie was based on a paper prepared by a couple of consultants named Schwartz and Randall, and the Bush administration managed to bury the report for several months. It actually came out in 2002, but it wasn't known to the public until 2003. That's when the movie The Day After Tomorrow came out. It was late in 2003 based upon that paper about abrupt climate change by Schwartz and Randall. And, and of course, it was Hollywood, so it was a little over the top, you know, helicopters freezing in midair, that sort of thing. I, 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 instead, we expect those kinds of changes to transpire over weeks or months, not 15 minutes. Could you give us a rundown um, of the, let's say if you had the top 10 major problems that we must begin to educate ourselves on, we must begin to become aware of, what would be the top 10? Global dimming, I think, is hugely important, sometimes called the aerosol masking effect and there is very little known about it in the public arena because the media and the governments, for the most part, are not telling us anything about it. You almost never see a paper in the mainstream media about the aerosol masking effect or global dimming. When I talk to people in presentations and I've been talking about global abrupt climate change and its likely consequences for more than 10 years now, and when I speak to people, they have to a person, almost never heard of the aerosol masking effect. They've never heard of this idea of global dimming. And there's a BBC video about it that runs about an hour from 2005. Where did that go? Nobody, I, I never ran across anybody who had seen that. And the research papers that started coming out in late 2011, and yet it's, it's the great unknown global dimming or the aerosol masking effect. So that is hugely important. Methane, water vapor as a greenhouse gas. I think relatively few people know that water vapor is the most abundant greenhouse gas. And the equilibrium time between 
moistening of the upper troposphere or more water going into the atmosphere and increased global average temperature is a matter of days or weeks. So it's a very rapid feedback loop, very rapid self Explain how feedback. that also contributes to more rain being dropped out of a cloudburst than we've ever seen in history uh, and worse hurricanes. Uh, as much as two times, meaning instead of a Category 1, it could be a Category 3 based upon how much velocity and because of the temperature of the ocean. When that temperature rises, and now it's in some place like the Gulf of Mexico, risen by 7 degrees and going up, that just increased where that moisture has to go. And it's going up, but it's right. going to come down. Right. The, you know, the planet wants to release that energy. The ocean contains an enormous amount of energy because of the extra heating that has been poured into it as a result of burning fossil fuels. There's an enormous storm, a cyclone, headed for Hawaii right now that if it hits Hawaii, now that we are out of the La Nina phase and into the El Nino, we're going to see a lot more of this in the Pacific Ocean instead of the Atlantic. If that hits Hawaii, it's going to be, probably it's going to be a Category 5. It may be higher than that. It may be a Category 6, which is a category we don't even have yet. Where have you seen anything like this in the major headlines or on the news cycle? Nowhere. I haven't seen a word. Nowhere, absolutely not. And the hurricane, a hurricane hit Hawaii at a Category 1 in the Outer mm -hmm. Islands, Category uh, mm -hmm. a Tropical Storm, but it inundated. It was the water, 36 inches of water in 12 right. hours. Right, and that is a direct result of planetary warming that we've already experienced. Warm air holds more moisture than cold air. And that's why when you're in the west and you drive up the hill, it gets colder and it also gets drier because warm air holds more moisture than cold air does. So as we warm the planet and we warm the atmosphere, and in fact, we now know that there's this, we, we now know quantitatively the relationship between the two. One degree Celsius global average temperature rise adds 7% additional moisture to the atmosphere. Well, that 7% has got to go somewhere, and we're now at one and three quarters degrees above the 1750 baseline, that's Celsius. So what that means is we're at more than 10% additional moisture in the atmosphere than we had at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Well, that's got to come out when, when we get a rainstorm, and thus the term rain bomb, which didn't exist until five years ago, and now that's all we hear about whenever there's a rainstorm. It's a rain bomb. What about the fire bomb? For the first time we ever heard that in American nomenclature in Colorado just about a month and a half ago. And we also heard for the first time from the local fire chief uh, heading at a, a group of volunteers that there was a fire tsunami wall where flames are 300 feet high. We've never seen that in American history. That's right. You know, when I was fighting fires as a youngster and then lighting fires throughout the graduate school. So t for 10 years, I was a wildland firefighter and prescribed fire specialist. And we called those fire whirls. And they were particularly dominant where cold air was meeting the warm air. So near the corners or near the edges of a prescribed fire, we'd get these fire tornadoes, what looked like a tornado, but it was flames. But they weren't 300 feet tall. They weren't anything like we're seeing in the forested ecosystems where they're happening now with every fire, every wildland fire that occurs. We see footage of these fire tornadoes, what we call fire whirls. And tornado is a better term because they're so much bigger than they were when I was lighting fires in the 1970s and 1980s. So, again, just another example of profoundly accelerated phenomena that we saw smaller versions of before. And I think that's what we face going into the future. People ask me what the future looks like. I think it looks like today, exacerbated. I think it looks like, you know, we've come an enormous way since we called them fire whirls in the 1980s to call them the fire tornadoes in, the, in 2018. And we don't have far to go before there will be no habitat for human beings on Earth as a result of this exacerbation, this acceleration of rain bombs, fire, floods, all of these phenomena that are going on that, that continue to be underreported. And yet, unless you're living in a cave, you cannot help knowing about these 
atmospheric and environmental phenomena that are occurring at a pace that we've never observed in human history. I believe that most people are aware of these crises, but they don't care. There's an indifference. We, we, have, we have entered the Cartesian uh, concept. I saw a movie last night. I wanted to see it because I had heard from friends that, boy, you want to see how bad movies are today? Go see uh, Filthy Rich Asians so, or something like that. So I went to see it. And the audience loved it. It's number one film in the world the last two weeks, probably this week also. Now imagine if the entire Kardashian family was asked to become the new royal family of America, where we no longer had a president or Congress. They would simply, their lives every day, what they eat and, and what they buy, that became the only thing important. And that's what it was showing all these uh, people in the film doing who were the richest people in Singapore and Southeast Asia, it was also about massive, vulgar consumption, the, the bottom side of, of obsessive decadence where a person only cares about themselves and how they look to the world. They don't know that the rest of the world exists. They don't care. They don't even care about people who are in their own clans or in their own family if they're lesser than them. That was made clear. Racism throughout the film and bigotry. And I walked out of the film and thinking all the people love the film, what did I miss? Mm -hmm. And then I reversed it. What did they not see? Mm -hmm. Because if they're if they're thinking that this reality is good and if no one wants to pull back and say, I'm not going to engage in this kind of vulgar, massive overconsumption of stuff I don't need, which can contribute to the demise of the planet, then what we have is we have about ninety percent of the American population who don't want to know the truth, will be angry at you for sharing the truth, think that you're a fatalist, uh, that you are, uh, that you are, you're a person that is somehow a nihilist. Mm -hmm. Instead of you're an honest, open, pragmatic mm -hmm. thinker who's saying, look, I'm going to be in there along with everyone else, but we're not all going to make it in the boat. At least be aware. But when we wake up each day and we have abundant food, when we walk down the street and there's food from all over the world, then we don't care that grains may not be growing at the same level in two years from now in North Dakota, in uh, Montana, in uh, Texas and California where grains are grown, in Kansas, Indiana, and Illinois, because they don't care. Somewhere in the world, those who want to buy something will have it available to them, supply and demand. The fact they'll be paying more for it. Now, at the same time, those same people, if you ask them how many people right now in Africa and in the Middle East will not be able to support themselves with having a regular, adequate water to drink and food to eat. And they'll say, I don't know. Right. Well, they don't have the slightest idea. And I said, well, let's try 1.3 billion people. Mm -hmm. That's the number that Rich and I, w in doing our homework for our film, came up with. Because you have to do a lot of re We've been researching this for 12 years before we started filming. So we know how many people are going to become disengaged from where they had been and become immigrants. Well, what happens when you have five million immigrants because of wars that we created, that, that Barack Obama created, that Hillary Clinton created, that the neocons created, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and George Bush created, and Saudi Arabia and all the rest taking no responsibility. And we can't handle five million people coming into countries. What are you going to do with a billion? Right. And that is apocalyptic in that area of the world. And we're not looking at it. No one's looking at the problem or the solution until it comes. And when it comes, it's going to come fast and furious. So we live in denialism, individual mm -hmm. denialism, mm -hmm. collective denialism, and group denialism. We're not dealing with Fukushima as if somehow it's not polluting 300,000 gallons of toxic radioactive water every day, creating the largest dead zone in the world, 1,200 miles long, 1,000 miles wide in the Pacific Ocean. Nothing can live there. We're not having a single story in the news cycle. It's not taught in any schools. So take us again. Uh, we well, only have a few minutes on this. A address what I just said. But then take us to a few more th serious things happening, like the, the, the conveyor belt that takes warm water mm -hmm. from the south, mm -hmm. brings it up mm -hmm. around Greenland and Iceland and, and uh, northern Europe, and brings it back down, how that's slowing down and the consequences of that gets too slow or stops. Also... Give us a few more of what the likelihood is of flooding, not just 
the inconvenience to having a building that you're living in have water coming up and sinking down and disrupting and breaking the tension so you can no longer live in a building because the stanchions are concrete resting on sand. And, and that's Dubai, the entire, entire community of Dubai, the dumbest project in world history. Billionaires spending money when they didn't have an eighth grade education and all these scientists from Germany and Switzerland, everybody lined up to take their money and not a single person had the courage to say, I can't take your money because you're building a sea level and you're going to flood. And everything you see in Dubai, these magnificent buildings, they're all going to crash and crumble. Not a single honest person in that entire fiasco, and yet everyone wanted to move there. Now look at it. The buildings are cracking. The foundations are rotten. Massive uh, problems. In fact, so bad that the emir had to step aside, and his cousin, who is the top person in the United Arab Emirates, the Seven Nations, had to come in and take over all of Dubai because there was a trillion dollars in debt and no one else could afford it because Dubai isn't a um, – Abu Dhabi is an oil-rich country. Dubai is not. But these are just some of the things that are happening. I'm watching because I'm interested in the topic. Mm-hmm. Other mm-hmm. people don't care and are not interested. Well, yeah, of course not. For one thing, there's no money in extinction, uh, extinction of any species. Uh, the notable example is one World Wildlife Fund, for example. It shows a picture of an organism that looks a lot like us, a mammal with forward-facing eyes, to try to generate money for themselves, for that organization. But otherwise, bad news, if you're the purveyor of bad news, as you often are, as I often am, we are accused, as you indicated, of being nihilists, of giving up, of throwing our hands in the air, of... Uh, you know, just about every horrible thing that you can be thrown at some that can be thrown at somebody is thrown at us because we're presenting, dare I say it, reality rooted in evidence. Of course, you know the the character who made Idiocracy, the film, which came out a little over ten years ago, said he thought he was making a documentary film, not a comedy, but he didn't realize it would happen so quickly that we have become idiocracy. We have become this, not just a nation, but a world of idiots, of people living for right now. And I'm I'm a huge fan of living in the now, don't get me wrong, but he's describing an entire culture that lives for the hedonistic version of pleasure right now and for the next few minutes. Hedonic. Aristotle's hedonic. Exactly. Exactly. And and we're there. How can you deny it? You look around. You, As you indicated, people don't care because what they care about is their own personal pleasure, first, foremost, and almost entirely. 1.3 billion people without food and water? <sighs> Not my problem, buddy. We're talking about within the next 24 months you're going to see this massive exodus and the breakdown of social systems all over Africa and the Middle East. Absolutely. It, it. it could be next month, Gary. It certainly will be within the next 24 months. I guarantee it. Let, tell us just a few things. Tell us about the, the three uh, remaining worst-case scenarios that are happening right now that we're not being informed of, including the circulatory system. You know, the thermohaline conveyor belt has definitely slowed, consistent with the evidence indicating that it has slowed or reversed at least six times in planetary history. And that was the basis for the film The Day After Tomorrow. That's a big deal. That's not nearly as big a deal as the cracking of the ancient ice in Greenland, in the north slope of Greenland, which, if you're paying attention at all, you've noticed pop up in your news feed within the last week or two. That's the last remaining ancient ice in the Arctic, and it's cracking and falling into the sea. That is truly horrible news for those of us who acknowledge that the Arctic is the planetary air conditioner. What happens in the Arctic absolutely does not stay in the Arctic. So there's two very important features that are influencing already what's happening in the Arctic Ocean. There are also, for the first time in human history in the last couple of years, cyclones in the Arctic Ocean. Cyclones in the Arctic. These are just supposed to be tropical phenomena. And now we're seeing, so there's three for you right there. And they all are happening and are influencing what's happening in the Arctic. When we lose the Arctic, when we lose the ice from the Arctic Ocean, we are in such serious trouble so quickly that there will be no time to recover. It'll be 
similar to a day after tomorrow movie sort of situation. Not that it will happen in seconds that the planet will, will freeze up, but certainly over the course of the next 24 months, there are going to be major, major changes that affect the set of living arrangements, what we call civilization, that affect the ability of essentially everybody on the planet to get healthy food, to get clean water, to just go through what they consider a normal day at this point. Hedonism is about to be gone. So for those who are using the old line, smoke them if you got them, recognize that the time is short. You're not going to have them for long. Just imagine being a Japanese citizen waking up in the morning and going through your day and mothers with their children and older men, because almost all the younger ones were out fighting in the uh, Second World War, not realizing just at some point in that day both Hiroshima and Nagasaki are going to be devastated. We're unprepared for emergencies. We're unprepared. Uh, we don't, even when we know something's coming, a fire, we know it's a week away or three days away, we don't go buy ourselves a trailer. We don't load up the trailer. We don't have backup gasoline so we can get out of that area. Mm-hmm. We, we, don't, we don't plan on building our homes so that there's water systems on the outside of the home or retardant fire. Rest- we do nothing. And then the fire comes and we rush out and get in a car and run away. And then the next day, someone with the news saying, what's left? Well, I didn't get anything out. Why not? But they never ask, why didn't you take time? You knew the fire was coming. We never want to put that guilt right. on someone. The Heaven forbid we ever make anyone responsible for the mistakes they make in their own lives. Well, you know, and I, I've been pursuing anarchism for most of my adult life, primarily due to the influence of Edward Abbey's writing. And the anarchism is the willingness to take responsibility for yourself. Most people think that it's the promotion of chaos or some such silliness. At one spectrum, it is. Right, absolutely. And, but, but for me, at least, the difference between chaos and anarchy is with chaos, there's an absence of rules. and With anarchy, there's an absence of rulers. Every person takes responsibility for themselves. And we don't see a lot of that now. There's capitulation to authority as if the government's response to Katrina 13 years ago was not enough to convince us that maybe we shouldn't rely upon FEMA for every time we have a problem. <laughs> we shouldn't rely upon FEMA for anything. If you doubt me, ask the people of Puerto Rico of and course. what we did not do in helping them prepare, what we didn't put in place, like food, real food banks and solar systems and backup power, we could have. We had the means to. We chose not to because it would not have been politically expedient for those in Congress, both Republicans that we expect that from, and Democrats who say that they're different Republicans except when it comes to actually doing something constructive. So this is this is the way we live. When Hurricane Sandy hit New York, it was the people from the Occupy movement who were feeding the FEMA people. Do you know that, every, that every day that we had uh, we had truckloads of food come in and water, and I had people come to our Upper West Side office and studio at 83rd and Broadway, where we've been for like 25 years, and we had. Um, we had cabs. Almost all of them were from Jamaica, uh, excuse me, from um, Haiti. And all these cab drivers would load up their car and they'd run it downtown and give these people free food and water. Now, and, and I commend those people for taking their time and energy to care about other people. And then I'm asking myself one day when there was a Haitian guy who says, why are you doing this? I say, it's not because I like the people downtown. It's not because they're moral or ethical. These are people working on Wall Street. We're, we're taking people, you know, do you really think that that's, uh, those are the people that, you know, I care about? I right, don't. Right. I'm doing this because my mother said if you have a gift, give it to those in need in that moment. Mm-hmm. Don't judge mm-hmm. them first. Mm-hmm. Give it to them. I said, blame my mother for my philanthropic nature. And he said, that's okay because sometimes when I'm downtown, I know what it means to have driving people who don't care about you. You're invisible if you're from Haiti or mm-hmm. Trinidad, mm-hmm. and now we're actually helping those people that never helped us. I said, well, mm-hmm. you have to take it one-on-one. You have to judge each person by their actions. But I'm looking at now what's going to be happening, and we're unprepared for it. By the way, down in Houston, 
when all the billionaires and millionaires were up in their apartment buildings not having any fear, they had uh, hurricane-proof windows, and they had water, backup tanks, and generators. Who do you think was in those boats? Who do you think was out there? Those were the rednecks of people, you know, mm -hmm. the, those were the deplorables. Mm -hmm. They, not the Clintons or any of the Bushes or anyone else, none of the rich, none of the powerful, none of your professors, none of your elite class, none of your, none of your dominant, hierarchical, artificially smug people were out there helping the people who were drowning or sick or abandoned. It was your average working class person who put their lives at risk being in contaminated water and not caring about themselves. And all those boats going out of there, those were real human beings. Yeah, you know, That's what's amazing. And they were never acknowledged uh, for their right. courage and their their benevolence towards others, and they're always the ones who show up in every crisis to try to help other people. And it's just amazing those who smugly sit behind their professorial desks. I have utter contempt for those who do not engage. There's no better measure of our character than how we treat those who can do nothing for us. Yeah, well, that, and, that's, and just, that's, <laughs> that's just condemned an awful lot of people. Exactly, because those people you're talking about in the ivory tower or in the skyscrapers looking down their noses at the rest of humanity aren't doing anything for anybody, much well, less those who can't do anything yes for Yes and them. no. Yes, that they don't do it, but yes, they did do something uh, in Puerto Rico. The rich, the hedge funds, they went in there to buy up the property at discount prices, right. take people who couldn't afford their mortgages, kick them out of their houses so they could turn that property around and sell it for profit. That's the capitalist system in America today. Right. And those people should be shamed. You shouldn't do anything uh, with these. And the people in Puerto Rico should point out, here are the buildings that these people took over. Here's how they're exploiting them. But they didn't give a single whiff of interest when we were suffering mm -hmm. through the hurricane. Mm -hmm. yeah? You have to go in the other room because we've got to start filming, and I'll continue <laughs> on, and, and we'll give more information when they see Thank the Thank you, film. Gary. It's a pleasure to speak with you, as always. Professor Guy McPherson.